Good evening and welcome to our Literary Cafe. My name is Helen Liu and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation, whose support enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. The Literary Cafe was created by the Foundation and they are pleased to collaborate with Marjan Kamali on this series. I would also like to thank the Lucius Beebe Memorial Library and the Public Libraries in Ashland and Tewksbury for partnering with us on this program. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A. Now I'd like to introduce our host. Marjan Kamali is the author of the national bestseller, The Stationery Shop, which is being adapted into an HBO series, and Together T, which was a Massachusetts Book Award finalist. Her novels have been translated to over 20 languages, Born in Turkey to Iranian parents, Kamali spent her childhood in Turkey, Iran, Germany, Kenya, and the US. She holds a bachelor's degree in English literature from the University of California, Berkeley, and an MBA from Columbia University, and Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from New York University. She's a 2022 recipient of the National Endowment for the Arts Creative Writing Fellowship. She currently teaches creative writing at Grub Street, and lives in the Boston area with her family. Please join me in welcoming Marjan, who is going to introduce our guest this evening. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you for um, introducing us and thank you to all of you for taking time out to join us tonight for this very special um, episode of the Cary Memorial Literary Cafe. I'm thrilled to celebrate Women's History Month tonight with um, three extraordinary authors whom I admire deeply, Joy Castro, Ava Homa, and Catherine Sherbrooke. Um, tonight, uh, in line with our Women's History Month programming, we're going to be talking about the portrayal of women's rights and desires in these writers' novels. We're gonna be talking about the responsibility that comes with telling stories about women who've been hidden from history and how writing about women's lives impacts women's futures. So I can't wait to dive in and discuss um, these brilliant works, but first, the teacher in me can't help but give you a breakdown of exactly how tonight will run. We're gonna start off um, with me introducing each author and having them give us a brief five to seven summary of their work. Hopefully they'll read a little bit from their work to give you a flavor of their writing. And then we're gonna open up the conversation where I get to ask these authors the questions that have been burning inside me leading up to this night. And then finally, we're gonna open it up to questions from you, our audience, which you can drop um, into our Q&A box. And um, we hope to wrap up the program in an hour, which is hard to do as there's so much to discuss. But Without further ado, let's get going. I'm gonna introduce our first author. By the way, I'm going alphabetically last name uh, just to keep things running. So I'm thrilled to welcome Joy Castro. Um, Joy Castro is the award-winning author of the 2023 historical novel, One Brilliant Flame, Flight Risk, a finalist for the 2022 International Thriller Award, the post-Katrina New Orleans literary th thrillers Hell or High Water, which received the Nebraska Book Award, and Nearer Home, which have been published in France by Gallimard's historic Série Noire, the story collection How Winter Began, the memoir The Truth Book, and the essay collection Island of Bones, which received the International Latino Book Award. She's also the editor of the craft anthology Family Trouble, Memoirists on the Hazards and Rewards of Revealing Family, and the founding series editor of Machette, a series in innovative literary nonfiction at the Ohio State University Press. Joy served as the guest judge of Craft's first Creative Nonfiction Award, and her work has appeared in venues including Plowshares, The Brooklyn Rail, Senses of Cinema, Salon, Gulf Coast, Brevity, Seneca Review, and The New York Times Magazine. A former writer in residence at Vanderbilt University, she is currently the Willa Cather Professor of English and Ethnic Studies, Latinx Studies, at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where she directs the Institute for Ethnic Studies. And I had the pleasure of meeting Joy a few months ago in Key West, 
we were literally literally sitting at a table having dinner at the Key West um, Literary Seminar. And I'm so thrilled to have you here tonight, Joy, to discuss your new novel, A Brilliant Flame. Welcome. Thank you so much, Marjan. It's such a pleasure. I'm so grateful to be invited and to be here with all of you. Um, so yes, uh, I'll share a little bit from One Brilliant Flame. Uh, the majority of the novel is set in 1886 in Key West, Florida, among the Cuban emigre community, uh, the anti-colonial, anti-racist, sort of utopian uh, working class community uh, that was involved in uh, helping the Cubans expel colonial Spain uh, from the shores of Cuba. And so Key West was the offshore rebel base 90 miles away. Uh, so as I said, most of the novel takes place in 1886. There was a, a historic fire at that time that burned the city to the ground. And arson was suspected by the authorities, but never proven. So there were a lot of political uh, energy is swirling and there was a lot of labor unrest. Uh, so this novel features six main characters, three young women and three young men, all of whom have a motive to want Key West to burn. Uh, and uh, they're all six of them narrate different chapters and I'll just read you a tiny bit so you can have the flavor of one of their voices. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit more and finish up. So the prologue actually takes place in 1898. That's the year that the Treaty of Paris was signed, um, liberating Cuba from Spain's colonial rule. Uh, and Zenaida, one of the three young women, uh, is older and she's reflecting. And here's how that begins. Just after dusk on the evening of Friday, August 12th, when the heat of the day had passed, the bank's mercury thermometer read only 82 degrees. My mother and I, both freshly scrubbed, perfumed, and dressed in our finest clothes after the long workday, entered the San Carlos Institute to play bolita. Bolita is a game of chance. It was a very ordinary Key West night. A soft, salt-scented wind blew through the open windows, stirring the cloth of our skirts against our calves and sifting the tendrils that escaped down the backs of our necks. The men wore their best dark trousers and white guayaberas, their thin pleats crisply pressed. The women were sheathed in bright sleek dresses that bared their collarbones and more, unless they were quite old, in which case they wore sober black and pursed their mouths at the rest of us. Little clusters, couples, families, friends, arm in arm, promenaded from room to room, pausing, chatting, moving on, as waiters whisked through, offering small glasses of sherry and thimble-sized cups of cafecito from round trays. Children raced about, laughing, playing tag or hide-and-seek. Gauzy blue veils of cigar smoke wreathed the air. Strains of music wafted from the ballroom where couples whirled in each other's arms, oblivious to the rest of us. So that uh, is the voice of Zenaida, and she um, is the daughter of a boarding house owner, a widow, and Zenaida helps take care of the boarding house, but secretly she is writing poetry all along, and I've had these little icons designed, and you can see that Zenaida's icon is a little uh, quill, pen, feather in an ink pot, and then um, I'll show you the other ones for the other two young women. I really love them. Um, one of them, so they represent all the different uh, social classes and racial uh, groups in, in Key West at the time. This one is Sophia. Uh, she's the daughter of a wealthy um, cigar factory owner. And then this character, I have to say, is my favorite, Javeta actually works in the cigar factory rolling cigars and she's fairly action oriented impatient uh, and uh, rebellious in all the best ways uh, that really make her exciting so there's a quiet poetic one uh, a, a well-to-do privileged one and then somebody who is a little uh, wilder 
And uh, then there are also, as I mentioned, three young men, and all of them come into conflict, and there's, you know, erotic desire swirling around, and then also the desire for political freedom. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joy. You blended those voices so well in the book, and I loved, I loved those icons. Every time I saw one, it just gave me a sense of satisfaction because we flowed so effortlessly into somebody else's voice. So thank you for that beautiful reading from One Brilliant Flame. And now we have next, we have Ava Homa. Um, Ava Homa is an award-winning novelist, a seasoned journalist, and a human rights activist. Her words have appeared in The Globe and Mail, BBC, Guardian, Literary Hub, Literary Review of Canada, and many more publications. She's spoken about women's rights across North America and Europe, including at the United Nations in Geneva. Ava has a master's degree in creative writing from the University of Windsor in Canada. Her book of short stories on modern Iranian women, Echoes from the Other Land, was nominated for the 2011 Frank O'Connor Short Story Prize. Her debut novel, Daughters of Smoke and Fire, the story of a Kurdish woman's search for justice and freedom in Iran, won the 2020 Nautilus Book Award, was a finalist for the 2022 William Saroyan International Writing Prize, and was Roxane Gay's audacious book club pick. Welcome, dear Ava. Um, Ava is a woman I admire deeply. She is a true activist. And Ava, take it away. Tell us about Daughters of Smoke and Fire. Thank you for that warm introduction, Marjan. I'm so happy to be speaking with you and these two other brilliant authors. Thanks to the organizers uh, for making this happen, bringing us together. And I thank you, our audience, for spending your evening with us. Um, so Daughters of Smoke and Fire is the story of a Kurdish-Iranian woman named Leila. And her dream is to become a filmmaker and be able to take the stories of her people to a global stage. But one day, her brother, Chia, who is a political activist, attends a protest, as they have been happening in Iran, and he, he goes missing. So he falls upon Leila to put her dreams on hold and figure out where her brother is and how he can be helped and saved. Um, I'm going to read one page, um, the prologue for a taste of the book. Um, so you will hear the word schler in the prologue, and that refers to this, to the crown lilies that grow across Kurdistan Plateau. Their significance because they're wild and they come in really vibrant colors, like a deep red or deep orange or yellow. Um, and so they're very symbolic of Kurdish resistance and resilience in that way. A woman alone on the mountain at dusk. An invisible boot pressed against my throat, making my breath labored and helpless. And yet I could not go back and face my parents or my stifled future. Hidden behind the boulder, I hugged my knees and imagined my rage and pain whirling into a wildfire, burning down all the injustices. Would my father have known what was going on? I wanted to tell him, to share this burden with him. My shoulders were already heavy beneath the daily cruelties of living as a woman in Lanatawa, the damp place. This fatigue was incurable. The sun had sauntered down, disappearing behind the lake's red bar. A dozen shades of red, red burst open along the horizon. Below, the narrow, winding asphalt road was the hem around the hill's green skirt, embroidered with clusters of red and yellow wildflowers. The Schler flowers stood elegant and tall, flourishing across the rough, Kurdistan Plateau defying borders. I yearned to be a Schler, but I was a garden of anguish, of loathing, of torment. My occupied homeland was a birthplace of death. I stood up, 
my breath now coming in pants. I wasn't hiding anymore. Bessa, Bess, I shouted, it's enough, enough. I started down the hill in a tumbling run and found myself unable to stop. Despite the chill of the evening, I started sweating. The wind whipped my headscarf and I gained speed. I flapped as if I had wings. As I ran, a whale escaped my chest. I was heading toward the main road, toward the world of men. The streets belonged to them, judgmental men, hypocritical men, their honor dependent on women, men. Cars hurtled around the curve full of drunk drivers who honked as they spotted me sprinting down the hillside. They were going too fast for this road, too fast for their sluggish reflexes and too fast for their old vehicles. A, weight, a white late model car careened down the winding road, kicking up dust. The wind roared in my ears. The white car and whoever was driving it seemed to seek me out as a fellow traveler. I stumbled on a stone, crushing the shiny red poppies in the grass. And as I lurch, my untold stories tumble inside me like pages ripped from a book and tossed, crumbled into the waste paper bin. An overpowering urge to scream my story, to expel it from beginning to end seized me. Suddenly I saw, I could see the heads of all those people crushed beneath tanks. Descending the slope at a breakneck pace, my shouts crescendoing, I was unable to stop myself, this crazed woman. A final lunge and I was airborne. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Ava. And you know, I first read this book when it came out, but I feel like with everything that's been going on in Iran these past six months, it feels very raw and sadly timely. And it's one that I keep going back to. And I think a lot of people are discovering it again or for the first time, especially with what happened since the death of Nasa Gina Amini. So thank you. Um, all right, Kathy, Catherine Sherbrooke is the author of a family memoir and three novels, the New York Times notable Leaving Coys Hill, which was selected for a 2022 Massachusetts Book Awards Honors in Fiction Prize, and Phil the Sky, the winner of a 2017 Independent Press Award and finalist for the Mary Sarton Award for Contemporary Fiction. Her newest novel, the Hidden Life of Astra Kelly is set to publish in April 2023, two weeks from now. She just completed 10 years serving on the board of Grub Street, the nation's largest creative writing center and Boston's first public art space dedicated to the written word. She shares her newly empty nest in Cohasset with her husband and Black Lab. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you for joining us. Tell us about leaving Coise Hill. Wonderful. Thanks so much for having me into the library. And um, it's just a delight to be here with all of you celebrating Women's History Month. And uh, so this evening, I'm, I'm here to talk about leaving Coys Hill, as Marjan said, which is um, based very closely on the life of Lucy Stone, who was the first woman really in our country in the US to speak out on women's rights and literally speak publicly about women's rights at a time when that was considered incredibly scandalous. Um, she was born in 1818. So most of the story takes place in the mid 1800s when she was really probably the most famous woman uh, in terms of a household name at the time. And yet she has fallen out of our kind of common cultural memory and in some ways was, was written out of history. Um, and so I'll just read a little bit for you. The book opens actually in 1893. So Lucy is 75 at this point, and it opens at the Chicago World's Fair, where she was asked to give one of the keynote um, speeches. And so there are throngs of people who come to hear her speak. Um, and so I'm going to pick it up here um, in the coming close to the end of Lucy's speech that afternoon, which was titled The Progress of 50 Years. So she was there to talk about what kinds of progress women have made 
over the previous 50 years. And she notices someone in the audience who she hadn't seen before. That's when I see her sitting in the front row of the balcony. How did I not notice her bright red shawl and wire rimmed glasses earlier? Susan B. Anthony, as thin and prim as ever, her power undiminished by her years, once my dear friend and most trusted ally, here she is, listening to me speak of our shared history, of the accomplishments we worked so hard together to achieve. It's kind of her to be here, but I cannot deny that the old anger still rankles, and I work hard to keep it out of my voice. I do not want her to know that I see her. I understood from the beginning that fighting for women's rights would not be easy work, that my own version of right and wrong would cost me friends, but never did I expect to lose this friend. And how extraordinary, really, that neither of us is likely to survive long enough to walk into a booth and cast a proper vote. That will be a bitter pill for her. It is everything to her. I summon my thoughts into a stream of words, coaxing them to flow through the auditorium. I will admit that I was blessed with a voice for this work. With a little practice, it's easy to speak loudly enough to those in the back row, so those in the back row don't have to strain to hear. Doing so while not overwhelming the front row is the trick. No one likes a woman who yells. But they say I was born with a voice like a babbling brook, soothing to hear even as it cuts a new path into the silt of an unsuspecting mind. I close my remarks with my most deeply held belief that what we need most of all to continue our progress is to speak the truth fearlessly. Where I found that courage at so young an age, I don't know. But as Susan once said, it is not bravery when you know you're right. I look up to her before I can stop myself and she tips her head at me, an entreaty to mend what divides us. Alice is at my side then steadying me against the sudden explosion of applause. Hope is on her feet as is everyone around her. Tears rush down her cheeks and drip into her bright smile. A familiar joy swells in my heart, the sense that maybe I've changed one mind, moved one detractor, made one woman's place at her own dining table a more respected seat. That is all I've ever wanted. I look into the balcony again to share the moment with Susan, but she has already gone. Thank you so much. Yeah. Another beautiful piece. Um, you know, when, as I was rereading your books, one thing that really struck me, aside from the fact that they magically have the same color palette in their covers, which um, we didn't plan, but they happen to. Um, one thing that really struck me is you're all writing about women who've been hidden from history, but also hidden histories. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes is actually by Harry Truman. There is nothing new in the world except the history you do not know. And I feel whether it's the history of the Kurdish people in Iran or the history of Cuban immigrants in Key West or the history, the true history of women's rights in this country, you're all writing about um, these specific periods where there is so much happening and so much that we were not told as a general culture. So I'm wondering if you could talk about that um, and why you chose to tell this particular hidden history. I'll start with Joy. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think that women have always been involved in every freedom fight. Um, we see women leading freedom fights around the world today, but we were always there. We were always part of it. We were always contributing and even leading. Um, we were uh, cutting through the silt of received ideas and offering new ones. Um, and we were very brave. Women were very, have been incredibly brave over the centuries and millennia. And so I think it's just been important to me to um, using the work of historians. So in the back of One Brilliant Flame, I think, like I think 15 uh, historians whose work paved the way for me and illuminated so much. Uh, um, you know, it, I think that it, it's tremendously important to reimagine what the interior worlds would have been like of those women, because those have been deliberately, in some cases, written out of history, and in other cases, just passed by, ignored as not being important.
but I think they're tremendously important and I think they inspire us, right? Hearing about Lucy Stone is inspiring. Um, hearing about your protagonist, Ava, is inspiring to people, right? And so I think we, we need to recover and reimagine what those worlds must have been like and, and what fired women in the past, you know, what they faced and what they overcame. Absolutely. And Kathy, talking about the women who, as Joy says, have been written out of history, tell us. Right. Well, first of all, in terms of this time period, you know, similar to Joy, what you were saying, that women have always been there. I think a, another piece of um, that, that's challenging for me is I think women's rights in our country, is, especially in the 1800s, is often oversimplified to being about the vote. And it's not that suffrage wasn't critically important. We all know how important voting is. But there were so many other rights that women didn't have, especially married women. They didn't have rights to their property. They didn't have rights to their own bodies. They didn't even have rights to their children. And so they were essentially chattel in their own homes. And that's not something that I was taught growing up. It's not something that's... Um, that I, that I that I really understood deeply. And so I was really intrigued in learning more about that time period. And then on Lucy Stone in particular, both because yes, she was written out of history and because she had the bravery, as you were saying, Joy, this it, in, unbelievable courage to go out on the world in the world many times all by herself in front of um, really dangerous crowds at times and speak first on behalf of abolition and then and then women's rights. And I think seeing, you know, when we see that someone has the courage to do something like that, then you, you know, I think you believe you can too. And so I was just so moved um, by her story that I, I really wanted to try and, you know, bring it back out of the shadows. And you did so effectively. And it's interesting to hear you talk, Kathy, in the past tense about these um, lack of women's rights. Oh, right, right. Oh. As, as yeah. Ava and I both sadly know in Iran, this is, we talk about it in the present tense. Right. So Ava, tell us about um, Layla and Daughters of Smoke and Fire. Yeah, so, um... Joy and Kathy responded so eloquently, I don't really have much to add. You know, when it comes to Kurdish women, the world suddenly paid attention to us when Kurdish women were fighting against ISIS. You know, the West hadn't heard of us, and now suddenly 60 Minutes, BBC, CNN, everyone was talking about this Kurdish woman fighting ISIS, um, and they acted as if we hadn't been there all this time. It's just they didn't want to know that we exist and we're fighting. Even when they started talking about us in the media, it was in such a reductive manner and a borderline fetish of girl with gun. No one said that Kurdish women, while fighting the brutal forces of the Islamic State, they were also fighting patriarchy within their own countries by banning child marriage, banning um, polygamy. And Marjan, as you said, in present tense, which is really, really horrifying. I mean, look at the contrast of these women on one hand being so empowered to have their own militia and to be able to go out there and do all of these inner and outer fights at the same time, right? Um, while being so oppressed. So which are you? Are you an oppressed woman or are you a very strong one? And you are both. You're really both at the same time, except the world doesn't want to hold new ones. It's easier to put you in one category or the other one. So it's very important for me to come and tell Leila's story to show that range for that Kurdish women live in between anywhere from um, being completely pushed to the edges of life, pushed so far, oppressed so far that you debate whether or not your life is worth living to make this not sudden and not easy. It's painful and it's difficult, but it, it is possible uh, transformation from being that person who doesn't want to live anymore to becoming this person that not only you find meaning in your own life, but you're also willing to hold a hand and say to other women, let's do this together. You're not alone and we can support each other. So true. And all three of you have that in common also in your books where your protagonists 
come to that radical acceptance, not just of their own situation, but then they take it one step further where they're able to lend the hand, as you say, Alva, to help the lot of all women. Um, you know, you the nuance you speak about makes me think of the role of politics, just the way we fetishize Kurdish women. You know, we see them as these women warriors and, you know, sort of corner them in this cliche, forgetting the incredible complexity. But in, in all your books, that happens a lot with the role of politics and how the women's rights are always, always linked to other fights. So Joy, um, when the Cuban resistance is trying to fight the colonial yoke of Spain, we learn that that's linked to also freeing women, uh, Cuban women in America and in Iran, um, there's always the fight for women's rights, but that comes hand in hand with the rights of minorities, right? You can't have one without the other, minorities like the Kurds in Iran. And also, um, Kathy, you show how uh, the whole movement for women's rights to vote is linked so closely to the abolitionist movement. So Kathy, tell us a little bit about that connection, because I think that's why Lucy is not in our everyday vernacular. Yeah, and and it's it was not only in that time, you know, so often I think women find their voices fighting on behalf of others. So a lot of the women's rights activists first literally found their voices and how to speak and and how to be um you know, agitators, as they called themselves, on behalf of abolition, and then realized, oh my gosh, we, we you know, we, we're we're all in the same um, boat. And you see it again in the '60s, right? The civil rights movement it, it was fighting again for for racial equity, and then the women's movement started up again. So they they seem to be intricately linked. Um, and to your point, Marjan, part of why Lucy Stone is written out of history is because she disagreed with Susan B. Anthony. The uh, the split that I mentioned that I in the in the piece that I um, read because they disagreed over the Fifteenth Amendment, which was the amendment that gave black men the vote before women, and Lucy felt she needed to support it because if anybody could gain the vote in that situation, she was willing to support it. And Susan B. Anthony, who was quite frankly more of a politician, um, saw that as a as a deathly compromise and. Um, made some some pretty upsetting choices actually to try and put fear in the minds of people for for giving black um, black men the vote, which I think started a really racial split in the women's movement that has never actually healed. Um, and so um, so that was an interesting part that I wanted to explore also. Yeah, yeah. And Ava, tell us about that the link in your book. Yeah, this is this is very interesting, Marjan, what you brought up, the interconnectivity of our fight for justice, that you can um, have a special field that you focus on, but at the end, all these movements toward justice empower each other, and a defeat for one is defeat for all, and victory for one is victory for all. It's the same, um, in the case of Kurds specifically, um, you know, for so long we've been fighting um, a national liberation because when the allies redrew the map of the Middle East and they gave everyone their own country, and the main ethnic groups in, in Middle East, which is Persians, Turks, and Arabs, Kurds were denied that. And when you're denied, you're not on the map, you're denied nation when you when humanity moved toward the age of nation state, it put us in this stage of fighting for something that others were already given. And so that put everything behind, including our women's right. Um, Toni Morrison has this beautiful quote about how racism makes you do redundant work. They tell you you don't exist. You prove that you exist. They tell you, you don't have culture. You go and bring evidence that you do have culture. So that's what happened to, to Kurds. But at one point we had this dramatic shift when back in the 1990s, Kurdish, a Kurdish leader in Turkey um, named Ocalan, who is in, in jail now, he was the one who had this moment of recognizing that a country, and this is his exact quote, a country won't be free until its women are. 
And in that recognition, he shifted the Kurdish movement resistance, right? Because the woman, Kurdish women's movement was basically on the back burner and the fight was national liberation. But with him, women movement became central to the liberation movement. And Marjan, as you know, that's where the slogan woman life freedom comes from, right? So that's the delight to... Um, to Iranian women's fight for equality as being the slogan of woman life freedom. And it's intertwined in Kurdish women's fight for freedom, which came from that awareness that neither of us are gonna be free until our women are free. And when I talk about women's movement, I, I, I think it as one of the most inclusive movements towards justice, because when you say women movement, I see a clear connection to abolitionist movement as well. You know, it's very intersectional. And because of its intersectionality, women movement, in my opinion, is one of the most powerful movements we have had. Beautifully said, beautifully said. And Joy, yes, I, I saw this theme in your book also. Yes, definitely. Um... That moment in Key West, which is underknown uh, in the United States today and in Caribbean history, was really a beautiful, utopian, hopeful moment of multiple struggles moving forward on several fronts at the same time. So the, the San Carlos Institute, uh, where the character Zenaida is taking her mother at the beginning, there was a school there. Uh, it, won, it was one of the only and the first bilingual and completely racially integrated schools in the United States in a Florida that was at that time very racially segregated. Um, you know, so there were um, fights against colonialism, there were fights against racism, and there were fights against patriarchy, misogyny and sexism, uh, all going on at the same time. And in fact, there's more information available to us today about the political fights against uh, Spain's colonial domination and uh, the fights against uh, racism than there is about the particular women in this moment. Um, they're in Key West because it's such a tiny little community uh, that's been mostly obliterated. Um, uh, and uh, so writing the women back in was something that I really wanted uh, to do with this novel and part of Part of it, too, was including the three young women's relationships with their mothers and giving their mothers powerful voices, too, as filtered through the consciousnesses of the younger women. But like uh, Marjan, I don't know if you would remember like Zenaida's mother. Um, oh, I remember. Yeah, yeah, she had herself escaped enslavement in Cuba and was now living uh, in Key West and uh, running this boarding house and was very influenced by Marx, you know, uh, because of the, the tradition of the lector, the loud readers in the um, cigar factories at that time, uh, all the people and especially the women of the town would cluster outside the cigar factories and listen to the readers reading the news of the day. Uh, you know, so it was for the cigar rollers to get this kind of entertainment education. Uh, but uh, the women, the housewives, the local women workers could also go and listen to um, classical novels by Tolstoy and Dickens and, uh, you know, like Les Miserables, and then uh, political theory, like anarchist theory by Mikhail Bakunin and Proudhon, uh, but also Marx and Engels. So they had this amazing university level auditory education that they could then deploy in their lives uh, and in their strikes uh, against um, you know the owners of the factory so there were a lot of strikes so labor unrest was going on at the same time in a very serious way there uh, and workers rights movements so yeah many struggles all at once uh, and uh, for me as a writer i can't do without centering the women Absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned the mother's joy because I wanted to talk to all three of you about motherhood in your work. Um, in Daughters of Smoke and Fire, there's a part where Layla wonders whether her mother is almost like a piece of furniture 
to, to the dad and, and whether part of the reason they argue is just because she wants to be seen. Um, and obviously in Leaving Coy's Hill, Lucy struggles with what will happen to her activism once she becomes a mother. Um, and in you know, and I loved um, how Zenaida, in one brilliant frame, asks her friend Sophie, what do you think your mother would be if she didn't have to be a mother? And Sophia, sorry, Sophia, Sophia thinks it's such an absurd question. Like, what do you mean, she, what would she be if she didn't have to be a mother? So you all explore the idea of motherhood as a source of strength, but also how it can be an impediment to one's goals. And you explore that so well. Another thing you said, Joy, that um, really struck me when you talked about the San Carlos Institute, immediately I could conjure up, I could conjure up the building, I could conjure up um, during the time when the lectures were reading how the factory workers banged on the wood with their knives. Um, all of you really create a sense of place that's so powerful and Ava, you, you bring to life Iran's cities, you bring to life the vista of Kurdistan's plains and uh, Kathy, old Boston with all its rich literary and political history. So let's get crafty because I know some students have also tuned in tonight. How did you work on your sense of place in the novel? Kathy, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks. So um, I did a lot of reading, you know, about this this time, and and there's nothing more valuable, I think, than primary research, which includes even illustrations that were drawn of certain protests. I have a great illustration of a huge protest at Faneuil Hall that happened, um, and then newspaper articles, and then letters that were written, and so just hearing. I think people took longer back then, take the time to describe what their, you know, daily routines were like. Um, and so, so all of that um, primary material gave me a really rich sense of, of what the city was like back then. And I, I also have the great benefit of, you know, some of these buildings are still standing, even though so much of the, the city has changed. Um, and, but then to sort of wash over it with um, the things that were, were different back then was, uh, it, it took me a long time to really get those, those details, um, details right, but it was a lot of fun in the research process. Yes, and it showed, it shows in, in the reading of it. And Ava, talk to us about, I mean, I know you, you lived in Iran, you lived in lots of these, um, parts of, you know, geography that you write about, but tell us how you did it. Yeah, I imagine that's a really good question because I haven't been able to visit since I left because of my writing and activism. So there was a lot of uh, emotions and nostalgia in writing about a place that I had no access to anymore. It also led me to the question of memory, how much of what I remember um, is accurate and how much things have changed. Um, since I left them, and um, yeah, I'm, it's kind of funny, but I'm grateful to people who uh, put videos themselves on YouTube that would just drive around town and play music and just drive around town, and previously I would think who would watch a video like that, well me, because through them driving, I get to see the city, city again, and I can pause, and I can zoom in, and remember uh, know what I wrongly remember, what I rightly remember, and and what has changed. Um, when it comes to a sense of place, um, I'm very sensitive to energy, and so um, I wonder about the energy of a place like uh, the Evan prison in, in Tehran, Iran, which has been keeping a lot of writers and intellectuals and artists captive and this place has also been bearing witness to all these great, beautiful, courageous minds behind bars and also how they have been treated in a place that wants them to not exist anymore. And what's it like to, to be that place, to hold so much memory, something that humans won't be capable of doing, right? 
or like the or the earth in Kurdistan where I'm sure Iran has one of the highest rates of execution in the world and we have we get some numbers but there is a lot of unreported executions that go on and um, all these mass graves that exist in these places what's the energy of the earth like when you're walking on these mass graves most likely not even knowing that you're walking on these various bodies that their families are still um, thinking about so uh, or are still looking for people are still looking for the family members that could be in one of these Lanatawa, these cursed places and so in so many ways the sense of place came to life for me that wasn't alive when I lived in Iran. So it, it became a character, you know, and not a human character because there's no way we can hold at all of this, but uh, it was a sense of rediscovery looking back at all of that. Mm, absolutely. And that atmosphere was very well evoked. We could really feel it. Um, and Joy, I know in your book, having I read it after I was in Key West. So I was like, oh, I know that street. I know that street. You had them turning right. You had them turning left. It was very satisfying. So talk to us about that. Thank you. Yeah, I had the great benefit of uh, knowing Key West deeply, even as a child, um, visiting our my grandparents there every year, staying in their home on Elizabeth Street. Um, the, the building where you and I taught, Marjan, had been a cigar factory, and it was the cigar factory where my grandfather was a lector. Um, and then uh, my great grandfather wrote an eyewitness account of uh, traveling from Havana to Key West in 1869 as a boy, uh, and then growing up in that uh, rebel community and seeing uh, duels fought in the street and so on. And as I wrote, you know, part of it was um, reading his uh, primary text as an eyewitness observer. Uh, some of it was uh, reading all the historians' accounts. Uh, Gerald Poyo is a really wonderful historian of Key West, and uh, so was Consuelo Stebbins. Um, and so I benefited from their work. And then Ada Ferrer, uh, who just won the Pulitzer for her new book on Cuba. Her earlier books on Cuba were incredibly helpful to me. And then as I wrote in terms of craft, I had a big map from 1884, mm -hmm. a reproduction spread out on the floor. And I, you know, it had like all the different churches and the town hall and the this quarter and that quarter, uh, the cigar factories, the merchant warehouses, the shipyards, right? And so I'm like, okay, well, this person needs to live over here. This person needs to live in this <laughs> world. Right? Yes. And, the, and this, um, and also, you know, the salt ponds, which play such a pivotal role in the erotic lives of the characters. It's a place where they go to get out of town and do things they don't want everybody to see. Um, I've been there and uh, not in that regard. I went with my elderly aunt, uh, but okay. Um, uh, you know, this place of nature and privacy and beauty, uh, the buoyancy of the salt water, um, the, and then of course the ocean. Um, so, you know, to immerse yourself in, in that physically and then be able to bring that to life for readers is such a pleasure. And all the fruits and the vegetables and the flowers and the plants, it's just wonderful to be able to do that. Yes, it truly is, isn't it? I mean, it's time travel for us too as writers and we, um, we get to immerse ourselves in these different worlds. Well, I feel like I should open it up to questions from the audience, even though I selfishly want to ask you all so many more questions, but I will be fair and open it up. Also, huge shout out to Kimberly Lawrence, who in the chat, as we are speaking, is dropping incredible pieces of information, links, backstory. Uh, she's a wizard, so um, the chat, I feel, is like a delight when we do these programs, thanks to Kimberly. But um, one of our, the questions now from our audience, Teresa asks for all, um, oh, four, which includes me, I guess, what is the best piece of writing advice you've received that you still use in your own writing? Hmm, mm -hmm. that would be mean. I'm going to call on you, Kathy. A piece of writing advice that, that really 
changed changed the way I work is to when I'm deep in a project is to write seven days a week, even if it you know even if it can't be for hours at a time, but to stay in the project because there's this belief that that I. I I truly believe that art comes from the subconscious and it takes a long time to get yourself into that place, but you can come out of it very quickly. And so the longer you can stay in it and, and even just thinking about the, the sense of place that we're talking about, really having to put yourself there and, and, and feel that you're in that world and in your characters' minds and in their interior lives, um, staying there every single day made a huge difference for me, both in the the quality and and uh, efficiency, I would say, of my writing. That was from Walter Mosley, by the way, who said that. Oh, nice. Very good. Ava. Um, interesting that Kathy said that, because Marjan, as soon as you asked that question, I remember Mary Oliver's quote that said, um, meet your creative side regularly, right? let your creative side trust you. But now that Catherine said, said the same thing, I'm wondering if I can come up <laughs> with something else to help our audience. That is really the most um, helpful thing to remember. But maybe for me right now, as I'm revising a manuscript that I completed, I've been trying to make a detailed and honest list of where my strengths are as a writer and where my weaknesses are. Um, and so um, list my weaknesses and then put them in front of me as I go through each page and make sure um, I am doing what I don't naturally tend to do in order to be able to offer a good uh, work to, to my audience and readers. I love that. Very good. Enjoy. The very best advice I ever got was simply this. No one can stop you. No one can stop you. But more practically, from a craft perspective, uh, something that I stumbled to eventually was when it, something's not working, a piece of prose, a story, or a novel, what I do, I don't work from an outline, but I take the piece of prose and then I make an outline based on what I have written, like an after the fact outline. Some people call it a reverse outline, but I find that a confusing term because it's not in reverse, but just an outline. What do I have here? What do I have next? What do I have next? And then when I see it in those sort of blunt bullet point kind of terms, I'd be like, oh, well, no wonder it's not working. The structure is faulty and this needs to go here. This needs to go here. But I almost never do that because like, I had a total last resort, right? <laughs> I just really resist it. I don't want to do that um, abstraction from the text itself, but I find that when I do do that, it's always illuminating. It helps me see where the structural flaws are in a piece. Yeah. Yes, definitely. But sometimes we can't do that till we have stuff down, right? It's 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 like you said. Sometimes it's after the fact. Um, and if I were to chime in, I would say one of the best pieces of advice I received was to throw away the clock. You know, I think so many people pressure themselves, especially in our culture of lauding efficiency and productivity. They think that they're supposed to be producing as though writing a novel is a production. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's a very inefficient situation, and I think it's good to embrace the inefficiency and maybe you can be efficient in other areas of your life and your day jobs or what have you, but writing is inefficient by definition. So don't try to make it efficient. Just, just accept that this will take as long as it takes. And, you know, I wanted to have published my first novel by the time I was 25. And I ended up publishing my first novel when I was 42. And it doesn't matter in the long term matters not one bit. So um, that's my advice. All right, so let's see. Um, okay, so we have another sort of um, writing process question, but I feel like 
we sort of covered it to be more inspired to keep writing and be creative, not to lose that routine. So I will use that. And um, Shanga is also shouting out to Ava for being a Kurdish woman voice and letting the world know why they're daughters of smoke and fire. So thank you for that shout out to Ava. I'll link it to, would this be a panel or a writing event if we didn't talk about the writing process, my friends? Uh, how can we avoid that perennial? It's the most popular question. I think we all know that we get asked the process. And I think it it you know links to what um, Shanga is asking because she's saying, how do you not lose that routine? And you know we all talked about hopefully having it, but how do you not lose it? So I'll just go back to Kathy for that. Yeah. Gosh, it's really hard. I, I find that um, it's when a lack of confidence begins to seep in that my routine starts to go. If I'm either losing faith in a project or myself and every project, I get to a point where I say, this is terrible. Like who is ever going to want to read this? What am I doing? And the, the only way I ever get through it is when I make myself sit back in the chair. And even if I'm not working on the, the the prose or the particular story because I've lost my confidence in it, then I write about what's bothering me even, you know, just having the pen to the page. What is it that's not working for me right now? Why am I so wigged out about this? I loved the story last week. What's going on now? And there's something about pen to paper and making the mind work and, and releasing kind of what you're saying, Marjan, releasing yourself from, oh, I, I promised myself I'd do 500 words today and I need to add pages to this, just keeping the mind going for me, then before I know it, I've slipped back in. You know, I've kind of, my subconscious again has tricked me into, oh gosh, well, geez, that, that scene would be cool. And then, and then off I go, but that doesn't happen for me unless I'm, unless I'm, and sometimes I'm literally longhand pen to the page Oh, my brain working. And yes, very, very true. And I'll just chime in now with my little tidbit about that. The way I stay connected is I do longhand. I mean, forget the computer, booting it up, opening the document. Half the time you get distracted. Pen, paper, pencil, paper keeps you in the flow. What do you say, Joy? Oh, yes. Yes, we're all fans of the pen. <laughs> tell me, Joy, tell me, Joy, what you do. Absolutely. Uh, One Brilliant Flame was my seventh book, and I've written all of them by hand. And I even write um, my, like, critical scholarship, you know, on film and literature. I write it by hand. It's different. It's a sensual pleasure. There's a kinetic uh, relationship to the work. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I just, it feels good. It feels good in a way that uh, typing at my computer doesn't feel good. That feels like a job. Uh, and writing in a notebook feels delicious and secret and luscious and wonderful and portable and no distractions. You know, I think it's, and you can draw, you can doodle, you can write nonsense and nobody ever has to see it. And I like it too. It's, efficient in a way because then when you go to type it up that's your first edit yes. right because uh you as any normal lazy human would be you're not going to type up things that aren't working right like that are boring on the page or that you're like oh what was i thinking right you leave that out and so just typing it up is right there your first revision so it's actually very efficient this is such music to my ears. My students who are tuning in know that I talk about this all the time. So to hear you say it, I just can say amen. Thank you. Ava, you showed us your pens. Yes, I do definitely do my first drafts with pen and paper. Um, it's more friendly. It makes it more possible. And I, I totally agree with what Joy and Kathy said. When I type it out, then I get rid of what doesn't have to go in the next draft. Overall, with creativity, it's such a um, tricky job because sure, you need discipline, but discipline is not all of it. The time you take to go for a walk, um, the time you take to you know, take a long bath. They're also part of your process. And we do live in the society. Imagine, I loved what you said about it takes however long it takes. It's so true. Um, so while we do tell ourselves, 
and it's important that we tell ourselves, I'm going to work on this seven days a week, five days a week, this time to this time. But we also have to accept that it doesn't always happen. And it's okay. We don't have to punish ourselves if it didn't happen. Like Kathy said, we have to, we can overcome mental barriers that we create for ourselves and get back to the writing. And like Joyce said, no one can stop you except yourself. It's our own doubts that that is our biggest obstacle. So well said, so well said. And on that note, even though my friends, I would love to keep chatting with you all night long, believe you me, because this is what I live for, these kinds of discussions. Um, unfortunately, our time is up and we'll have to say goodbye for now. But everybody who tuned in, everybody watching later on YouTube, you get to stay connected to these wonderful authors through their books. So please um, look up their work, read their books. So much heart, energy, and stamina goes into every single book that's out there. And um, these three women have written beautiful works that I know will stand the test of time. So thank you, Kathy Sherbrooke. Thank you, Ava Homa. Thank you, Joy Castro. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. And thank you for not stopping. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for having us, Marjan. This was Marjan, you're a great moderator. And now I know why you put us all in one panel. We have more in common that it's, that it's visible at first looking at the book. Thank you. Thank you for being such a great moderator. It's my pleasure. Thank you all. And thank you to everybody to, who tuned in. Thank you to Cary Memorial Library and the Cary Library Foundation for making this possible. Have a good night, everybody. Read, write, dream, take a bath. Do what you <laughs> do. Good night.